Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about drawing, painting, and sculpture, and specifically how you can analyze them based upon the processes that artists go through in order to create a piece of art. And this will give us some insight into more than just the surface product that's produced, but also what goes into that and what that means in a larger picture. All right. So when we think about art and the role that it plays in the, the environment, it's worth noting that um, nature has been a theme for art as, as long as humanity has existed. Uh, talking about wildlife, talking about nature is part of one of the things that inspires us and influences us because that's part of our life and existence as humans. Um, this is a piece of artwork that I have some fondness for. Um, when I was younger, I used to do a lot of backpacking, hiking, and I was also did a whole lot of art at that time. And I really was attracted to this piece. It hung on my wall for a long period of time. It's called Wander Above the Sea and Fog by Caspar David Friedrich, uh, produced in 1818. Now, I, I like this one a lot. I think you might find it also a beautiful piece. Um, but Something to note about the way that art interacts with the environment is that historically, uh, particularly in Western art, it hasn't always had positive implications. So the way that we describe nature, the way that we show na and demonstrate nature has an implication for what our imaginations are for how we interact with that nature. So this is an image uh, which sort of demonstrates a certain dominance over the landscape. It presents the, the landscape, the, the person looking down above at the pinnacle of the mountain, looking down on this, this landscape that seems wild and separate from humans. Uh, there's often themes in uh, 18th and 19th century art around rationality and, and the wild and how we can go and colonize or tame uh, that, that wildness. And in some ways, this type of art and this type of imagination influenced what people did and the way that we interacted with the natural world. As opposed to seeing ourselves as a part of that world, we saw ourselves as separate. And this is um, represented in a number of different ways. I mean, we see it today, for example, in the fact that uh, mountain climbing is a common thing where uh, in a lot of Western cultures, it's a big thing to climb to the top of the mountain and to show dominance over it. Uh, whereas um, in the Himalayas, uh, going to the top of the mountain is seen as being a, a somewhat disrespectful to gods, right? And that there's actually a, a, a respect for the, the mountain itself. And that is not something that's seen as being a admirable thing to show dominance over nature in that way, right? So these are cultural elements that start coming into these pieces. And I should give credit to Amy Lambert, a colleague of mine, who raises these ideas around how 19th century, 18th, 19th century art really created this idea of the conqueror and dominance over nature. And the ways in which art can both have positive influences, perhaps, uh, but it also possibly can have negative influences, too. So uh, let's move forward and talk a little bit more about how we think about art, uh, drawings and paintings, etc. So one thing that I want to address is some of the ways that we think about good versus bad art. Um, very often we view art as being something that should be a highly practiced skill where you're accurately representing the world around you and where a certain type of art, which is seen as being ugly, for, for example, is not seen as being valuable. Uh, for example, the, the my kid could do that. So this is a Jackson Pollock uh, where there's splattering of paint around. And um, it's very easy to miss in this what what intellectual tradition, tradition this was part of and why this is actually seen as being important work. Um, because uh, sometimes we just look at that surface initial impression and forget about all the stuff that happens behind the scenes. So 
Um, in this lecture, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we get beyond that surface to think about that, the ideas behind it and some of the, the craft and other elements. And this is a framework that was presented in Understanding Comics, but it's uh, generated from art history. Um, I, I think that this is a very famous comic book that essentially talks about art history and describes a lot of these conceptual ideas. We'll talk about it more when we talk about um, sequential art. Um, but I think this is a very helpful framework, framework as we talk, talk about drawing, uh, painting, and sculpture. Anyway, what is the steps that we sort of think about? Well, uh, first off, uh, as an artist is going forward and trying to think about a piece, they're going to come up with some sort of idea that they want to express. Now, that idea could be a concept, you know, some sort of message that they're trying to convey. Uh, it could be some sort of emotion. Um, or it could be some sort of image or depiction that they that they care about, some reflection on art, for example, at a basic level, right? So anyway, someone is going to come in to be motivated to produce art for some reason, and that's the idea. Then there's a form. So if they're, they have an idea for what they want to do, they are going to express it through some mechanism. Now, that could be any of a range of things. It could be poetry. It could be writing. It could be film. Uh, in this case, we're going to be talking about sculpture and, and paintings, etc. But uh, they have to choose a way to actually express this. Then there's the idiom, or in other words, like the school that the, the artist comes from. So there's different backgrounds that you could have from in traditional art, like surrealism or, um, or um, Dadaism or um, any of a number of different types of art traditions that you might come from. Uh, and um, this still exists today, you know, even if you're talking about video games or other types of work, there are different types of categories of art that have their own set of rules and general depictions and uh, intellectual tradition. And this is important to understand in the idiom because it's, a, it's part of the context in which the artist is having a conversation with other artists. Right. Then there's a structure. So here's where the artist is thinking about essentially a composition, how they're setting up this art, uh, what they're including, what they're not including, how what it's trying to show and how that's composed. All right. Then in five, you have the craft and that's the actual process of going through and producing art in a certain way. Um, the, the, the experience of using paint and producing different textures or uh, actually accurately conveying something that someone's trying to draw, an animal or a landscape, for example. And then six is the surface. And that's sort of essentially the product that you come out, out of the art, artwork process with. So that's the final product that we actually see when we, we look at art. So one thing that is important to realize when we look at this process is very often the thing that is easiest to see is six, which is the surface. We often go backwards. So we look at a piece of art and usually very often the only thing we think about is just what we initially see. But very often the important thing about art is not what you see. It's what the story is behind the art, why the art was done, what the what the art is trying to say. Right. So if we only look at that surface element, we could be missing out on a lot. Right. And what you find for artists is very often they start off with a surface uh, and as they grow and mature as an artist, they can't be go deeper and deeper into developing more complex ideas in those earlier stages. So you might start off as an artist, for example, copying art that you happen to like, but as you get more developed, you might integrate novel types of structure or uh, uh, develop your own sort of genre or approach school or approach to doing something, right? So there, there is a, a sense in which as you go further down this line, you get, uh, you get deeper into the art. Now, uh, this... Uh, Scott McCloud sort of presents this as the idea of the apple, that you have the idea and form at the center, and as you go out, you get you you move outwards from that basis, right? Um, something that's sort of interesting that he's noting here in the second panel is just the idea that very often the first artist to do something doesn't necessarily do the best job, but 
people later on will, will sort of replicate it uh, and sometimes create a, a better surface image, but they may not have that intellectual tradition, that complexity of ideas that happen behind it, creating art that is, uh, in Scott McCloud's word, words, more hollow. It doesn't have that depth of meaning that we think about for uh, artists who are really working within those traditions and creating new ideas. All right. So let's walk through this a little bit and talk a little bit more about these ideas. So again, ideas, we're talking about why people come to their art. Why do they do the art? What, what emotions are they trying to convey? What feelings, what ideas are they tr trying to communicate? Well, Scott McCloud has created a, a graphic for trying to explain this. And um, as you can see, uh, across the bottom, you go from uh, on one side, the specific side, is where you have a photo, a picture of a photo, on the other side where you have a very simple line drawing of a face, right? And as you go up towards the top, you see that that face becomes increasingly abstract. And I'm not going to explain what this means, but I'm going to start off by explaining that bottom axis there. All right, so let's focus in here. So what's being said in this picture plane, essentially, is that <clears throat> there's a spectrum between having art that looks perfectly like what you would see it, for example, if you take a picture, right? That's one extreme where it's highly realistic over to uh, images which are highly iconic, very simple and try very quick to see what they are. Um, the, the extreme for having I iconic image, imagery is actually letters. Letters uh, like the word face is uh, essentially taking going from you know what we saw as pictographs which would be like the ultimate icons into actually using word uh, letters to actually convey an, an image right so you'll find that art will very often move along the spectrum between being very realistic versus being more iconic now very often we privilege the photorealistic the 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 artist who can very accurately um, convey a picture so that looks almost like a photo. And this is a photorealistic artist. This actually is, isn't a photograph. This is a painting. And it looks like it could be a photograph um, uh, by Lang Jun. Um, anyway, point, point being here, very often we, we focus in this way because I, or I think it's because as we grow up, when we're learning how to do art ourselves, we're taking art classes as kids, very often the measure for whether or not you do a good job or not is whether you draw the house in a way that it looks like a house or you draw the cow in a way that it looks like a cow, right? And we have this idea that accurately presenting something is the most important thing, but that isn't necessarily the case. And we'll talk about that more later, but um, I've talked previously about James Castle, you know, his artwork, for example, is not um, very refined in terms of the imagery being photorealistic. But when you understand his history and what he did to try and as an outsider artist to create this art that depicted his life, um, it's really impressive to see the creative work that he did uh, on his own, right? So um, sometimes the ability to accurately convey a, a picture is not always valued as being the most important thing. In fact, sometimes having an image that is simpler is actually preferred. So um, the, the level of detail that you see in our work makes a big difference for how it's understood and responded to. So um, let's just use the emotion of heartbreak. So we have two images here. Um, the first is fairly photorealistic, a very realistic image. Uh, and on one side and on the other side, you have a uh, essentially an icon, a very simple image uh, conveying a, a message. Now, what's the difference between these? Well, um, on one side, that realism creates a very specific image um, and it has a certain story behind it. So there's uh, a lot of distraction. So why, why is a light coming in that way? Uh, who is this person? We can tell exactly what this person looks like. So uh, a white man, man, I believe, with blondish hair, right? He's wearing a blue shirt. Uh, and has a pop collar. Why does he have a pop collar? You can look at this image and think about this person and their story in a fairly complex way, right? And it's not general. It's a, it's, it's a very specific image, okay? Now, 
On the other side, we have an image that you can look at very quickly and get a message, a story that's being told there. It's immediate, it's very direct. It doesn't have all the distractions of the lighting and all the other stuff. It's conveying a message in a very simple, direct way. And that's what we think more of as icons, right? As opposed to the, photo, um, the realistic Im imagery, okay? Now this is very important because as an artist, depending on what you're trying to convey, you may choose to be somewhere on the spectrum between these images. Um, the other thing that you sometimes use in, in this uh, iconography is symbolism. So when we're talking about that bottom layer, very often artists are trying to convey a message. So when we're thinking at the bottom of the pyramid, we're, we're talking about uh, work that's trying to tell a story or tell something about the world, right? And uh, this is just a symbol for Extinction Rebellion, and it's a very simple symbol. Um, which is an hour, hourglass. Um, and um, the idea being that time is passing and we're running out of time to deal with the climate change crisis, right? Um, and just that very simple image uh, creates an icon which has been used to communicate very effectively. Um, it could be that you could do a very complex image which would have a very detailed hourglass but it won't work well as a logo. It wouldn't convey things as quickly and as easily, right? So um, the other thing about symbolism that's important to identify in art is it's a way of conveying more information with a simple image, right? So it's something to pay attention to as we look at the art that's produced. And um, very often when we talk about the work along this lower level, we're thinking about conceptual art. So art that's tr trying to tell a story or, or provide an idea to the audience. So uh, this is an image called Treachery. Uh, this is a uh, painting called The Treachery of Images by Magritte. And, it's, and what it says below is, this is not a pipe in, in French, okay? And the idea behind this, as you may know, because you've probably seen this before, is it actually isn't a pipe, it's a painting. And actually, it's not a painting, it's pixels on the screen that you're looking at right now, right? And the idea here that's being conveyed is seeing behind beyond the image and recognizing that imagery is treacherous, right? So that's what Magritte is trying to say. It's a conceptual art. Um, and, you know, in this case, it may not be the most refined art. Um, it's it's pretty refined, but it's not photorealistic, for example. But the point of the art is actually to have a very simple image that conveys an idea um, to the audience. And that that's the idea that what we're talking about. We're talking about conceptual art. A lot of uh, climate change related art actually falls into that conceptual art category. The other thing to pay attention to in this ideas category with respect to this is a way in which the art is mirroring the world. When conceptual art is trying to say something, it's trying to present an image. Sometimes it's a utopian image, sometimes it's a dystopian image, sometimes it's distorted in some way. So we're trying to see and identify in the art what it's trying to tell us about the world that we're in and what, what it's trying to reflect back to us through that artwork. All right, so let's return to the picture, picture plane and look at this uh, other axis as we go up the plane. And that's the idea of abstraction, going from uh, photorealistic art up to very abstract image uh, uh, symbols at the top or, or shapes. So um, this is a, a image, a, a cartoon that essentially is showing the process of, of abstraction, where you have in the back, you have the original image of a, a city scene, which then becomes more simplified, which then gets turned into um, uh, lines with colors and then turned into color blocks, where you can actually see how uh, an original image becomes a very abstract image, right? Now, um, there's some, there's reasons why artists sometimes become increasingly abstract. Now, this might be an interest in trying to explore what art, what color is, right? Their interest is not in conveying a message about the world, let's say climate change or something like that. The thing that they want to look at is art in a pure form. What does color mean? What does doing this experimentation with color mean? mean for art, for for beauty, or for that expression, right? Um, and 
Uh, so we'll often see that artists will have some different sort of different layer along that level of expression towards abstraction in terms of um, forcing people to engage. Now here, uh, we see that this artist is uh, Paul Klee, it's called Red Balloon. So part of, part of abstraction actually forces the viewer to try and, the more abstract something is, the more the viewer has to engage with that art to try and figure out what it's trying to say, right? So abstraction can actually be a tool for making an audience engage and work with a piece of art to understand, understand it, right? All right. So, um, so we have this, this, um, picture plane. And the reason that this is kind of helpful is for us to get an understanding of where art is fall, falling in this overall spectrum, right? Uh, it can be from specific to iconic, it can be from realistic to uh, abstract, uh, with levels of geometry or other things like that. Um, and, you know, you'll find with different art movements that, different art, art tended to fall in different categories for this. Um, now, one thing about where art lands on this plane is that it actually tells you something about the artists themselves. So if they're in uh, the lower uh, corner, uh, the specific realistic corner, very often artists who fall into that corner are really interested in nature and under providing clear depictions of the nature of the world and being very specific and uh, telling us in a realistic way about a specific experience, right? It's something about the, the values of that type of um, realistic, natural approach, okay? Uh, on the other side, uh, we have the iconic. So artists who tend to focus on the I iconic, they may not be very interested in some of the um, the details. In fact, they might find that the details are a distraction. They might be most interested in conveying a message. They want to say something quickly and efficiently or very clearly uh, and really accentuate that with uh, an image that's been pared down as much as possible to convey that message as clearly as possible. And then at the top, you might have artists who really aren't interested in those types of stories or concepts they're really interested in art for art's sake and understanding colors and shapes and other things like that and uh, conveying that and expressing that and, and that beauty. So, you know, understanding where artists fall in the spectrum helps you understand what they're, where they're coming from in some ways. All right, so let's talk a little bit about form. All right, so there's many different forms that art, art takes, as I mentioned, it could be video, it could be um, it could be uh, writing, it could be any uh, any form of expression. When we're thinking about uh, what I'm talking about in this lecture, we're talking about drawing, painting, and sculpture. Drawing uh, at its base level uh, is has a lot of similarities with paintings, but I think it's helpful to note, as Scott McLeod mentions, is that simple lines, very simple drawings can actually convey a lot. You you see like straight lines you see, that can convey like proudness and, uh, you know, like uh, uh, clarity. And you can have um, jagged edges that um, are, you know, aggressive in some way, or the curve, warm, rounded lines, or, you know, a, a line that's sort of angry and, and, and sharp, where it uh, looks like it's scratched in, or some, a line that's kind of vague. The idea here is just that lines in and of themselves can convey messages. And there's ways in which through drawing that we can uh, com convey that. Now, drawing actually blends in with painting. So uh, a lot of drawings, very, very often you have, uh, sometimes you'll have pen and ink uh, drawings, which will then be painted with watercolor as well. You can have drawings, pastel, where you draw and then you blur, that it almost becomes like a painting, right? So there's, there's fluidity between drawing and painting. Um, but a shared element to this is that it's 2D, uh, typically two, f fairly 2D in, in the way that it's expressed. Um, now, painting uses um, colors and, and, and essentially taking colors to, or, or paints to smear and to combine uh, and smudge in some ways to convey an image. Uh, and that's, a, that's another way of expressing 
uh, this. And uh, I said before it's 2D, in some ways you can use textures and other uh, ways of using this, uh, this medium to convey different types of understanding. Now, there's a few things about painting and drawing that, is, that are notable in the sense that um, unlike, say, film that we've talked about or stories, you have to convey in a painting something in a fairly clear way. You have a different process of trying to, uh, in a two dimensions, to, to tell a story or to try and describe something. That's why you often see pull the use of multiple things, motion, symbolism, other types of techniques to tell a more complete story in this two dimensional uh, form. Sculpture uh, is similar to, um, to drawing and painting and very often categorized with drawing and painting, uh, but it moves to using three dimensions. So this allows for different types of perspectives and uh, for viewing art from all different, viewing art from different directions, for example, right? You're not looking at it straight on, perhaps, you're looking at it from multiple angles. And, um, you know, this, this provides certain types of challenges uh, and benefits. So uh, it allows you to do certain things you can't do with two-dimensional art or that's harder with two-dimensional art. Um, but it also means, for example, very often you don't have certain resources of two-dimensional art. So uh, typically sculpture doesn't have a background, for example. Backgrounds are very useful for conveying information. Um, they use a lot of negative space. So where are the holes in the art, you know? So there's different ways in which sculpture comes through. And, you know, a sculpture, as mentioned before, can be anything from very abstract to very, very, very realistic. All right. So when we think about moving on from the forms that are used, um, we could talk about the idiom. Um, so idiom, uh, as we've talked about before, Western art traditions that are very famous, you know, expressionism, classicism, uh, Baroque art, etc. There's lots of different forms and school, schools and ideas of art that sort of come together um, and will sort of create a school of thought around things or um, uh, um, a genre of art that, that artists are working in. And this is important because, again, art doesn't exist independently, typically. It, it's a conversation within the field of art, and that's part of the audience is engaging with it, the critics are engaging with it, and it becomes a conversation within a field. So understanding what genre or school an artist is working within helps you to understand what's going on in that art. Um, when you're when we're thinking about um, that, um, it's also worthwhile to think about the ways in which uh, artists make choices about the art that they're going to express in the genre that they're working. It can be, um, you know, uh, differences in terms of size of the art, you know, whether it's really big or uh, that's a huge installation at the top uh, representing uh, the sun. Um, and at the bottom, you have a tiny piece, really small, few inches pieces of art um, that um, uh, we've talked about before, politicians discussing climate change. So the scale of art can actually make a big difference in terms of what you're seeing. Um, color is used in art widely to sort of try and convey certain things. You could have a sa the same image uh, done in an abstract way just using tonations of, of black and white, or you could try and use color to create a more realistic, vivid image, uh, or use color to sort of highlight certain parts of a, a painting or a drawing to try and highlight that for the audience. And sometimes color is used symbolically. Uh, different colors are, you know, mean different things in different traditions and have different religious meaning, for example, right? So, um, we can also think about composition, um, which also connects to those points of size and other elements. But here we're thinking about how is the art set up? So how is it framed? What's included and what isn't? Uh, so a frame will determine what's inside the art and what is not, right? Uh, how you set it up, what's, what's in different places in the artwork and how is it designed in, in that composition? Um, by having, different sort of sorts of tonalities to this 
to this um, art. You can have different emotions or expressions. Um, you can force people to engage in that art more by having it be uh, more abstract, right? Um, so this this is a uh, a way in which art can can have different structures. And then you have craft. So uh, in the craft of art, we recognize that uh, artists can use different techniques or different approaches to try and convey different things, say emotions or senses, to to describe this in their art form of choice that they use. You know, and you could argue that different types of art different ways of expressing art or drawing can convey different types of emotions or feelings, right? So the top being angry, right? Uh, for example, that's a very like striking image there or happiness, perhaps in the next one, the curved sort of open sort of designs or loud at the bottom, right? Or a cold, for, for example, for that, uh, the triangles there, right? The idea there just being that different types of this is this will be of course be somewhat subjective, but different ways of expressing in art can convey different things, and uh, the tonality of that art can do that as well. When we're talking about surface, we're talking about the finished piece of art. Uh, so this is what we actually just engage with. If you if you just saw a piece of art and you didn't know anything about why it was created, who created it, or the context in which it was created. We could still look at it and form our own opinions about that at a surface level. Um, and I'm just going to show some different types of climate art that are produced. Um, so uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we have a long tradition of art, uh, art uh, in the tribes that have existed here for, for millennia. Uh, and uh, this is a piece of art by Tom Steer, uh, Tom Spear, uh, really local, the Duwamish tribe, um, where he used uh, color and the typical U and S shapes in Pacific Northwest art to draw a bear with a cub. And very often in local uh, tribal art, they're describing experiences of people um, and also interactions with nature and the spirituality that goes into the creation of this. So understanding that not just the image itself and the abstract, the choice of abstract imagery around this and intricate design to convey the bear and the, and the cub, it's also understanding the history and religion, uh, uh, spirituality and um, culture that goes into the creation of this art to understand what it is. Another piece of art that you may have seen already because of the Seattle Art Museum uh, by John Grade is called the Middle Fork. And this was a piece of art where uh, it's trying to essentially both depict uh, nature in a way that we don't normally see it, but also recognize the way that nature goes back to nature and degrades. So John Gray, Grade worked with a, a group of artists to actually make a cast of um, like a 150 foot hemlock tree out in the Snoqualmie Forest. They actually went up the tree and took a few weeks to actually cast the entire tree. And then they took small blocks of wood and actually recreated that tree uh, so that it could be shown in, uh, in, in installations. And it could actually be brought around to multiple locations to be seen. It allows the, the public to see the magnitude of this living tree in a different way and to engage with it in this space. Now, something that's interesting about the intention of this art is he also really wanted to talk about decomposition uh, in, in nature and how um, trees return to the earth, right? So the intention for this art is when it's done being displayed is that it will be put next to the tree that it's modeled after and it will then be decomposed there and they will do a time-lapse photography of this tree decomposing, right? So um, that's just one example of environmental sculpture. Um, this is Alison Janae Hamilton. Uh, and this is a piece of art uh, that's in Storm King uh, Park. And uh, Alison Janae Hamilton is a uh, sculptor and artist who uh, is really interested in the South and uh, the way that race and um, and um, 
oppression essentially interact with people's experiences. Uh, and this is a piece of art talking about climate in the sense that uh, it's actually a monument to people who died in uh, the 1928 uh, hurricane that hit Florida, where there were thousands of uh, African American farm workers who died in that in that hurricane, uh, and then were buried in a mass grave and never recognized. And this is a piece of art that she created uh, of a stack of tambourines to recognize this. And um, it was also influenced by a poem that that sort of talked about this 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 story. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, here uh, bringing in some of the social justice elements to it. Again, knowing the story to this helps understand what that image is. Um, Asuncion Molinos Gordo, and I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly, uh, did some work around um, this is uh, in a, a, um, a series called Accumulation by Dispossession. And this particular piece of work is called Dumping. And you know, in and of itself, it just looks like a bunch of bags, um, you know, uh, wrapped by um, by by cords, right? Um, but what it's trying to convey, or what it's talking about, is the process the the process by which um, corporations go into poor countries and and bring in a large amount of a commodity and essentially dump it on the market, putting. Uh, um, small farms or small businesses out of business and then uh, because they can't compete with this new market and once everybody's out of business then they write, raise the price of that commodity right so um, and <clears throat> a lot of our work talks about the ways in which um, capitalism interacts with vulnerability in respect to climate and challenges uh, related to uh, socioeconomics um, Barty Care, uh, this is a, a tree that uh, uh, she created called the Whack Whack Tree, um, which is, uh, it's from a tradition where it's actually a tree where the leaves there, which you can't quite see, the leaves are actually small heads of animals and people. And the, the traditional story around it was that people would come to that tree and uh, as you walk past the tree, it will the the heads would give the passerby wisdom, right? Um, and uh, and you see here that the tree is on its side, right? So imagery around the the impact and the wisdom that can be provided through nature and the interaction with nature. Um, Jill Pelto is an artist that I, I just wanted to talk about. I, I liked her work because she sort of had an interesting combination of of drawing nature but combining it with science. So here you see um, this is uh, Gulf of Maine temperature variability, right? So you'll see that there's actually a chart in this looking at the temperature. And here she's trying to talk about how uh, the the, temp the rising water temperatures are influencing fish in, in the Gulf. Um, this is a picture here in Washington State uh, that she drew from being here in Washington State during the fires in 2015. And uh, here we look at um, uh, average temperatures uh, increases uh, in the chart that you see embedded in the image. Uh, and here are our proxy, it's, this is called proxies for the past, where we see different types. Of, the first is um, ice cores. Uh, then we see, um, um, then we see um, slices through trees. And then we see uh, for tree rings. And then we see um, uh, algae, fungi. And um, again, getting back to the idea that understanding this uh, and, and, down, and the line that goes through it is average temperatures over the last 10,000 years. So you see that spike at the very end there. Um, so again, getting back to the idea that looking at something on the surface in the previous image, I would have a lot of trouble understanding what that was if I didn't know what it was. But understanding something about the background uh, that she was working with, uh, here is just an example of an artist statement about someone's work where she presents her ideas around uh, how ice cores, uh, tree slices, and and, um, and the, um, the uh, algae, um, sorry, lichens, are used to actually develop our estimates of how temperature has evolved historically, right? So um, 
So again, the idea that as we go through this process of thinking about uh, art, not just from its surface, but all the elements that go in before it in terms of the craft, in terms of the structure, in terms of the idiom, the form and the idea or purpose, are, we can combine those together to really get a better understanding of what these images are that we're looking at. All right. So uh, in this lecture, we were really trying to talk a little bit about drawing, painting, and sculpture and think about the process of developing that. And think about some of the ways that we can go and actually analyze and critique work in terms of where it falls in, for example, the picture plane, um, what, the, what the different angles at which you can look at art, and also think carefully about why is it that some art that looks very plain or looks like it was not very well rendered or developed may actually really be pivotal, important, and deserves our attention and respect. Um, so these are just some ideas to think about. I hope that they're interesting, helpful. I find it rather fascinating myself. Um, so thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy looking at some of, some of the artwork as we go forward and take care everyone.